Hello everyone, once again warm welcome to you all on Janak lecture series in another different video lecture. I am Janak Aosti from Nepal. Today we will be talking about the development of the gastrointestinal system and the anomalies associated with the development of the gastrointestinal tract. This will be particularly useful for the ones who are preparing for the USMA examination. Let's proceed. The pictures and the charts compiled in this lectures are adapted from the different books with due acknowledgement and will be used for teaching and learning purpose only without any commercial motive. The pictures that I have compiled over here are compiled from The Developing Human by the Keith L. Moore and Chibin Persuad and from the next book like Langman's Embryology and the human embryology by Sean Wolf et al. In these pictures, I have displayed the folding of an embryo. This is the sedital section of an embryo. We can see the two amniotic cavity over here, and in between, the, we can see the three germ-led discs. This blue color one is the ectoderm, and this yellow color is the endoderm, and this red color over here is the endoembryonic mesoderm. And as the development proceeds due to the growth of this ectoderm which forms the brain and other part of the nervous system because of that there occurs a cranial folding and uh, along with the cranial folding there is also the caudal folding and because of this cranial caudal folding now what happens is that the heart which was initially on the cranial most portion slowly moves toward towards the midline and as this movement is occurring or say this cranial caudal folding is occurring this part of the endoderm which is lining this yolk sac is being incorporated into the future gut tube which is being formed over here this is the further advancement of the same cranial caudal folding we can see the heart tube in the pericardial cavity being formed and it is again being pushed towards the midline and the white communication which was initially in formed in between this future gut tube and the yolk sac now it continues to narrow we can see the communication between this future gut tube and the yolk sac it is now narrowed and this narrow communication we now call it as a white line duct and we can see now over here the future gut tube the the mid part of the gut tube which is the mid gut it is initially it is in communication with the yolk sac through the white line duct and the cranial most part of the gut tube it is closed with the oropharyngeal membrane or we can also call it as a buccopharyngeal membrane and the caudal end of this gut tube which is closed with the membrane known as cloacal membrane and at this region of the oropharyngeal membrane and the cloacal membrane which future dissolves to form the future mouth and the anal region at this point there is only the junction between the endoderm and the ectoderm there is no intervening mesoderm present at the region of the oropharyngeal membrane and the cloacal membrane we can see the overall pictures that we talked till now we can see the endodermal seat which is initially in wide in communication with the yolk sac but later on as the cranial foldings proceed the communication between the gut tube and the yolk sac it narrows and that narrow part of communication between the yolk sac and the future gut tube is the vital line duct and the gut tube we can divide into the foregut midgut and the hindgut and there are different anatomical structures to separate this foregut midgut and hindgut we will talk the, about them shortly and this is the same pictures we can, we can see the formation of the gut tube initially there is the lateral plate mesoderm which where the coelom appears and because of that this lateral plate mesoderm it is separated into the parietal mesoderm and the visceral mesoderm and this visceral mesoderm it lines the yolk sac the endoderm lined yolk sac and as the development proceeds what happens is that these two layers of the, this parietal mesoderm we can see over here they approach towards one another and they fuse to form an uh, intraembryonic cavity or intraembryonic coelom and this 
intraembryonic coelom consists of the gut tube being suspended with the mesenchymal bar to the posterior abdominal wall. So this mesenchymal bar suspends this gut tube, endoderm lined gut tube to the posterior abdominal wall. And yellow color over here is the endoderm lined part and external to it we can see the pink color part which is the visceral mesoderm. And this visceral mesoderm along with this endoderm it forms the different structures of the gut tube which we will talk in on the further upcoming slides. And this gut tube it is suspended within this pericardial cavity sorry it is suspended into the anteroembryonic body cavity or say future abdominal cavity with the help of a dorsal mesentery except in the portion of the future sep uh, future diaphragm or say the inner region of the septum transversum this gut tube is communicated with the anteroabdominal wall through the septum transversum so we see the dorsal mesentery that is present throughout the gut tube that is suspending this gut tube to the posterior abdominal wall whereas this gut tube is attached to the anterior abdominal wall only in the region of the septum transversum and that is not true throughout the length of a gut tube at the region of a mid gut this gut tube is in communication with the yolk sap so at that level this wall this it is not completely formed or it is not completely packed or it is not completely bounded like this structure and this intraembryonic cavity it is superiorly it is bounded with the help of the septum transversum which is going to form the future diaphragm that separates the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity so that is the uppermost demarcation of the intraembryonic or the abdominal cavity and this gut tube that is suspended within the abdominal cavity with the help of the dorsal mesentery we can see this is whole is the dorsal mesentery and in the anterior part there is the septum transversum and this septum transversum it forms the different structures it has got the different fate we will talk about that later on so this part of a dorsal mesentery depending upon the different region it has got the different name posterior to the stomach it is known as the dorsal mesogastrium portal to the small intestine that is called the mesentery and we can see in the region of a colon it is known as dorsal mesocolon so it has got the different name but actually it is the dorsal mesentery or say dorsal mesenchymal bar which is going to form a mesentery and passing through that is the different arteries of this gut tube we can see the celiac artery is passing we can see the superior mesenteric artery is passing we can see the anterior mesenteric artery is passing in the infra infra in the region of abdominal cavity that is lying below the septum transversum so this organ we can see over here in this picture that this is the gut tube being formed and around the gut tube there is the visceral mesoderm and the body cavity it is externally lined with the parietal mesoderm and there is changes occurring in this mesoderm which thins out and forms a bilaminar membranous like structure which now we call it as a mesentery and if the gut tube it is completely surrounded with that mesentery which is formed from this visceral mesoderm it that is completely surrounding this gut tube we call that organ as a intra peritoneal organ and if the organ are located in the posterior abdominal wall but it is not actually need to be true that the organ must be uh, always present in the posterior abdominal wall to be the retroperitoneal organ so retroperitoneal means the organ which have got the covering of this parietal this, this uh, peritoneal membrane only on the one side we call it as a retroperitoneal if they are covered only on the one surface only on their one surface that is we are going to call that organ as a retroperitoneal organ and we can see how and there are some organs which were initially intraperitoneal and later on as the development proceeds this intraperitoneal organ becomes retroperitoneal 
and this is how it occurs in this picture we can see the part of a gut tube which was initially intraperitoneal being suspended with the help of a mesentery to the posterior abdominal wall later on this mesentery fuses with the dorsal wall or the posterior wall and this organ is now only covered with the mesentery on the on its ex one side and the posterior side it is devoid of a mesentery now such type of organ which were initially intraperitoneal which later becomes retroperitoneal by the fusion of a mesentery to the posterior abdominal wall such organs are called secondary retroperitoneal organ and the fusion of this mesentery to the parietal peritoneum is known as zygosis we can see the gut tube over here this is the gut tube and part of a gut tube we can see it is protruded into the umbilical cord and this gut tube is communicating with the yolk sac to the vital line duct and in this region we can see the a portion of a hind gut it is communicating with the fine slim structure known as allantois this allantois is again projected into the umbilical cord and we can see in this gut tube there is a formation of a tracheobronchial dry reticulum we can see the liver is being formed gallbladder is being formed pancreas is being formed and we can see the further advancement of this organ this pharyngeal gut it is going to form the pharyngeal pouches and we can see the growing tracheobronchial bron diverticulum growing liver growing pancreas and we can see this changes are occurring in the cloacal cloaca and which is going to form this is going to form the future urinary bladder so now what are the future fates of this gut tube we are going to see this now so before that we will talk about how this gut tube it is differentiated into the three different parts foregut midgut and hindgut so foregut it is lying we can see this yellow color structure it is the foregut and this foregut you see the part of a foregut it is above the septum transversum and below the septum transversum as well so the foregut the cranial most part of a foregut which is going to form the pharyngeal pouches is known as pharyngeal foregut so this pharyngeal part of a foregut that is pharyngeal foregut it is going to form the future head and neck region so we are not going to deal about the derivatives of this pharyngeal foregut over here in this lecture and in the thoracic part of a foregut we can see the respiratory diverticulum is being formed which forms the endodermal lining of a trachea and the lungs as well and we can see this part this is the future esophagus and there is the part of esophagus below this septum transversum and we'll see how the esophagus it is developed from this part of a foregut which we call it as a thoracic part of a esophagus this part as a pharyngeal esophagus and this part as a thoracic esophagus and this part as a abdominal esophagus and this growth of a esophagus it is affected with or the it is modified with the changes occurring into this in its associated organ like the this bulging over here we can see this is the bulging of a heart tube and this diverticulum it is going to form the future lungs so the growth of a lungs and the development of a heart they indirectly affect the growth of a esophagus as the heart and lungs as they grow in size they push the septum transversum below and that helps in elongation of this esophagus that is actually the effect of this heart and the respiratory diverticulum developing in this region it helps in increasing the length of esophagus so now we'll talk about the different arteries which are supplying to this different three different part of the foregut sorry the three different part of a gut the foregut it is supplied with the celiac tron the part of a gut tube which is below the septum transversum it is supplied with the celiac tron and the part of a foregut which is above this septum transversum it is supplied with the four or five definite branches that are arising directly from the aorta and the midgut it supplies by the superior mesenteric artery and the hindgut it is supplied with the inferior mesenteric artery 
so supplying the gut there are three different arteries celiac trunk superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery and the thoracic part of a foregut it is supplied with four or five definitive branches from the aorta now let's see the derivative of a gut tube for now we will be only observing the derivatives or the future feet of a foregut we saw that i also discussed that the cranial part of a foregut it forms a pharyngeal pouches we won't be discussing this part right now it forms a esophagus which is the which is the part uh, which is the derivative of a foregut and it also forms a liver bulge which is going to form the future liver and it forms a stomach it forms the liver it forms a gall bladder and also the duct of this gall bladder and the, the duct communicating the gut tube and the liver and it also forms the pancreas and the cells of a pancreas as well so in the start i have displayed what are the derivatives of this foregut it forms the pharynx which is going to form the pharyngeal pouches it forms the thoracic esophagus it forms the abdominal esophagus it forms the stomach it forms the superior half of a half of a duodenum that is superior to the hepatopancreatic ampulla and this part it is going to form the liver parenchyma hepatic duct epithelium gall bladder cystic duct common bile duct and it forms the dorsal and the ventral pancreatic buds including the exocrine and the endocrine cells and the ductal cells of a pancreas so these are the detail derivative of a foregut so we'll talk about how this derivatives are formed in the upcoming part so before talking about the development of a organ we are going to see how the this development of a organs are regulated in a molecular level we can see this is the endoderm line tube gut tube and it is surrounded with the similar topography the mesoderm and the ectoderm so this ectoderm mesoderm and the endoderm they interact with one another in a genetic level to regulate the development of a an organ and specify the location of a an organ at particular level so this specification occurs because of the interaction between these three different germ layers so in this slide i have tried to explain about the specification or the localization of a particular organs like the pancreas liver stomach duodenum and hindgut how this differentiation of this different part and the localization of this different structures are regulated in the molecular level for example when we take the liver for the development of a liver or say for the localization of this particular liver or the site of a development of a liver it is regulated through the interaction between the endoderm and the mesoderm so the septum transversum which is the mesodermal structure it produces the bone morphogenic factor similarly the cardiac mesoderm it forms the fibroblast growth, growth factor and this bmp and efgf through this this endoderm and the mesoderm they interact with one another and regulate the production of this different factors from the endoderm with the help of this interaction the sonic hezog factor albumin and alpha pitoprotein the production of this factor is enhanced by this regulation the endoderm produce this factors and this specifies the location of the development of a liver so this is the future site of a liver regulated by the enhancement of this different factors and when we see the location of the ventral pancreas we can see over here the endoderm it enhances the production of this factor pancreatic pancreatic duodenal factor 1 and inhibits the production or the enhancement of this sonic hezog factor which regulates the development of a ventral pancreas and at the location of the development of a dorsal pancreas the notochord it inhibits the production of a sonic hezog through the fibroblast growth factor 2 and activin 
through this factor the notochord inhibits the production of this sonic hazard actually the sonic hazard it is produced by the endoderm throughout and at the particular location its secretion or its production is inhibited like this over here in this region it is being inhibited the notochord inhibits the production of the sonic hazard through the fact fibroblast growth factor 2 and activin and with the help of this the endoderm enhances the production of the pdx1 and insulin promoting factor 1 and the sonic hazard it is inhibited and this enhances the development of a dorsal pancreas so we can see this is the location of the development of a dorsal pancreas and at this region the ventral pancreas is being developed and when we talk about the development of a cranial part of a stomach we can see that at the future cranial stomach the sonic hazard transcription factor production is stimulated whereas the pancreatic duodenal factor 1 its production is inhibited and this leads to the localization of the development of the cranial part of a stomach and at the site of a development of a duodenum we can see the promotion there is the enhancement of a development of a sonic hazard factor and decrease or sorry there is also the enhancement of a development or say secretions of the transcription factor pdx1 and this localizes the development of a duodenum and when we talk about the specification of the hindgut at this particular region the sonic hazard produced by the endoderm it interacts with the mesoderm to form the bone morphogenic factor so sonic hazard and bone morphogenic factor act together to stimulate the production of the hooks d13 and it helps in the cordial localization of the hindgut so this is how the different part of a gut tube and the development of a different organs are specified through the interaction between the endoderm mesoderm and ectoderm so at this picture i have displayed the genes they are specifically responsible for the different part of a gut tube development like they are the color code given like cso x2 it helps in the specification of this this part of a foregut PDX1 it is helping in responsible for the duodenal part of a foregut. CDXC it helps in specification of the midgut loop. CDX1 it helps in specification of the hindgut loop. And oxygen it is also responsible for the development of the liver. We can see the oxygen is regulating the development of a liver. And we can see the pharyngeal part of the gut tube and the allantois part of a gut tube also are being regulated with the genes and this genes they are which are responsible for the development of the endoderm they produce sonic hazard and this sonic hazard interacts with the factors produced by the genes present in the mesoderm so the hoxin 9 10 11 12 13 which are present in the mesoderm this gene interacts with the sonic hazard produced by the endoderm and help in the specification of the small intestine, cecum, large intestine, cloaca. In this region, I have only displayed the development of the, this part of the gut tube. And with this, we can conclude that the development of a gut tube it is regulated through the interaction of the ectoderm, mesoderm, and the endoderm. And there are the genes involved and the different transcription factors are involved to specify the development of a gut tube and the localization of the different organs which are being derived from this gut tube. Now we are going to talk about how the esophagus develops. So in this picture, this yellow color structure is a foregut and esophagus is the derivative of a foregut. We won't be talking about this pharyngeal part of a esophagus we'll talk about the thoracic part of a esophagus and partly the abdominal part of a esophagus so this thoracic part of a foregut and the abdominal part of a foregut they are responsible for the formation of a esophagus and this development of a esophagus as i previously told it is indirectly under control of the developing 
heart tube and the developing lungs. So this developing lungs and the heart tube as they increase in size they push the septum transversum downward and that help in the elongation of this esophageus being formed. So that helps in increasing the length of a esophagus that is being formed right now. So what happens is that the endoderm lining foregut we can see it give the respiratory diverticulum initially this respiratory diverticulum it is in wide communication with the foregut but later on there occurs the formation of the tracheoesophageal fold and this tracheoesophageal fold it move towards one another as a tracheoesophageal septum and this septum fuse with one another and separate the future respiratory diverticulum from the future esophagus and there is still a communication between this respiratory bird and esophagus we can see this is the endoderm line tube and this red color we can see it is the mesoderm and the respiratory diverticulum being formed over here and as there is the formation of the tracheoesophageal septums we can see it separates the respiratory diverticulum from it but cranially this tracheobronchial tube it is in communication with the primordial pharynx we can see this is the primordial pharynx and this is the tra laryngotracheal tube they are cranially in communication so the future trachea and the future or esophagus cranially they are in communication with one another but inferiorly they are separated with the help of the tracheoesophageal septum and this forms the future tracheobronchial bud so as the development continues the endodermal epithelium it proliferates rapidly and it obliterates the lumen of a esophagus and but later on what happens is that there appears the cavity formation or vacuoles are formed in the obliterated lumen and this cavity fuse with one another they collapse with one another and again there is the open communication or there is the recanalization process that again opens the lumen of a gut tube and this recanalization occurs by the end of a eight week and by the end of a seven week the esophagus attains the or attains the appropriate length and this increase in length it is supported by the developing heart and the developing lungs as i previously told when we see this esophagus in the transverse section till now we only talked about the endoderm the fate of endoderm which is going to form the esophagus and this esophagus externally it is supported with the number of structures like lamina propria muscularis mucosa muscularis externa and externalmost covering is the adventitia that is the histological structure of the esophagus so when we see the developmental origin of this esophagus the endoderm it just form the epithelial lining and the glands so the epithelium in the es esophagus it is the stratified squamous epithelium we can see the study lumen of esophagus and the stratified squamous epithelium over here and along with that the stratified squamous epithelium the endoderm also forms the glands this gland that may be present in the submucosa or mucosa itself and rest other part like lamina propria muscularis mucosa the muscularis externa and serosa all of these are derived from the visceral mesoderm they are surrounding which are surrounding the endodermal line tube and in the muscularis externa we see the two different types of muscles in the cranial part there is the striated muscles and in the caudal part there is the smooth muscle and in between the intervening part of the esophagus there is the mixture of this both striated muscle and the smooth muscle and the nerve supply of this muscle it is through the vagus because the vagus nerve is the nerve supplying the caudal pharyngeal arches that is the fourth and fifth the fourth and sixth pharyngeal arches they are supplied with the vagus nerve that's why it carries the same nerve supply also in the esophagus 
now let's talk about the clinical correlates of the development of esophagus the first one is the esophageal atresia in atresia what happens is that the tube it is ended blindly and this atresia it may be associated with this fistula also so the blind in tube it is known as atresia if the tube it is abnormally connect, abnormally connected with another epithelial line tube that is known as fistula so it occurs because of the abnormal deviation of the tracheoesophageal septum if the tracheoesophageal septum which is separating this esophagus and the trachea if it deviates another way it cut off the different tubes like this we can see it is abnormally ending this future esophagus it is ended up blindly over here like this and this condition is known as atresia and we can see the different types of atresia we can see the both ends they are blindly end in this picture one end is communicating that is forming a fistula we can see both the ends are making a communication with the trachea and this is the another form and this is the next different form and this is the most common form of the abnormalities associated with the development of the esophagus and this tracheoesophageal atresia it, it is associated with the other defects like the vertebral defect anal atresia tracheoesophageal fistula and the renal defect and sometimes it may be associated also with the cardiovascular defect and the upper limb defect along with this it is also associated with the polyhydroaminosis it is causing the polyhydroaminosis it is so because we can see the for esophagus it is being blindly end up with the help with this structure what happens is that the fetus cannot swallow the amniotic fluid and because of the obstruction in the swallowing of the amniotic fluid there is increased accumulation of the amniotic fluid in the amniotic cavity actually this amniotic fluid undergo circulation through the swallowing process ultimately it undergo into the maternal circulation through the placenta by its absorption in the intestine if the circulation is inhibited there is no there is obstruction in the regulation of the amount of this amniotic fluid and because of that the amniotic fluid increase in amount in the amniotic cavity which results in the polyhydroaminosis and it is also associated with the tracheoesophageal fistula as we talked right now and this is the most common tracheoesophageal abnormalities that usually occurs and next is the esophageal stenosis stenosis means the narrowing of a lumen that lumen is narrowed it is because of the hypertrophy of the submucosa or the muscularis externa layer and sometimes the tracheoesophageal tracheal cartilaginous ring may be present around the esophagus and if there is the failure in the recanalization process the stenosis may occur so these are the different causes of the esophageal stenosis which causes the decrease in the lumen of the esophagus we can see the cartilaginous plate it is around the esophagus we can identify the esophagus with the help of this stratified squamous epithelium and the esophageal glands which are present over here in the submucosa and the mucosa the next abnormality associated with the development of esophagus is the achalasia it is because of the loss of the mantric or the orbic plexus ganglion and because of this loss of this ganglion the gut tube cannot relax after the constriction as there is the absence of the parasympathetic nervous system which causes the relaxation of the gut tube and as there is no relaxation the part of a gut tube which has no ganglionic cell it remains constricted and the part superior to it or the cranial to it it undergoes muscular hypertrophy because of the long standing achalasia and when we see this abnormality in the barium mill x-ray we see this as a bird beak structure this constricted part of a gut tube it appears like a beak of a bird 
Now let's talk about the another derivative of a foregut, which is the stomach. The part of a foregut which is lying below the septum transversum, it undergo differential changes that forms the stomach. We can see this is the future region of a stomach. It undergoes slightly dilatation and the other changes do occur in this particular region that forms the adult type of stomach. And we see this part of a stomach foregut which is going to form a stomach which is going to form the stomach. It is suspended ventrally and dorsally with the help of this mesentery. So there are such changes also in the mesentery as the stomach develops. We will see that changes too. So this is the part of a foregut which is destined to form the stomach. This part of a foregut which is going to form the stomach it is suspended with the suspended in the abdominal cavity with the help of a dorsal mesentery and the ventral mesentery which are present on the posterior border and the anterior border of this gut tube and on the either side on the right and left side there is a presence of the vagus nerve the right and the left vagus nerve and as the day proceeds there occurs a fugiform dilatation and this occurs because the posterior wall of the stomach it grows rapidly than the anterior wall and because of that there occurs the fugiform dilatation and now this fugiform dilated part of a foregut it undergoes 90 degree rotation and because of this 90 degree rotation what happens 90 degree rotation around the longitudinal axis and because of this rotation now the posterior border now comes to lie on the right hand side and the anterior border comes to lie on the left hand side and the posterior border it forms the greater curvature and the anterior border it forms the lesser curvature and this anterior border there occurs a distortion and this distorted anterior border forms a lesser curvature we can see the distortion being formed and the posterior border it undergo differential changes which forms a greater curvature and the upper part of a greater curvature there occurs the differential growth of a cell which forms the fundus and the part of a mesentery which were attaching to this posterior border and anterior border they form the greater momentum and the lesser momentum the mesentery attached to this lesser curvature it forms a lesser momentum and the mesentery that is attached to the greater curvature it forms the greater momentum and the distal part of the gut tube it is going to form the future duodenum. We can see the part of the duodenum also being formed and the changes occurring in this part we can see that is influenced by the developing stomach. And as the stomach develops there occurs a number of changes. One change is that we talk right now there occurs in the there occurs a change in the position of a mesentery. The ventral mesentery it forms the lesser curvature and the dorsal mesentery it forms the dorsal it forms the greater momentum it forms the lesser momentum and the vagus nerve which was present on the left surface it comes to lie on the anterior surface of the stomach it supplies the anterior wall of the stomach and the right vagus which was present initially on the right side now it comes to lie on the posterior surface of a stomach supplying the posterior wall of a stomach these are the two changes third change is, is that initially this cardiac orifice and the pyloric orifice they are in the same midline but later on because of the differential changes this cardiac orifice it comes to lie slightly on the left hand side and the pyloric orifice it comes to lie slightly on the right hand side And the development of a stomach that also occurs also on an anterior posterior axis. As the stomach, previously we talked that the stomach rotates around the longitudinal axis. And because of that, the number of changes do occur that we write, that we talk just right now. And the stomach also rotates in the ventrodorsal axis to come into its adult position. And because of that, the cardiac orifice it comes to lie 
slightly downward and the pyloric orifice it comes to lie slightly upward which gives the adult position of the stomach and we can see the developing stomach along with this mesentery we can see this is the fusiform dilated part of a foregut which is going to form the stomach it is suspended to the anterior abdominal wall with the help of a ventral mesentery and to the dorsal wall through the with the help of a dorsal mesentery and this dorsal mesentery at this portion of a stomach is known as dorsal mesogastrium gaster it is related to the stomach as the development proceeds now there occurs in the there occurs a change in the dorsal mesentery the dorsal mesentery also rotates as a result of which there is the increase in the gap lying the posterior to the stomach the gap increases in size transversely because of this rotation of the dorsal mesogastrium and in the dorsal mesogastrium we can see the spleen and the pancreas also being developed and because of the anterior posterior movement of a stomach along the axis because of that this part of a dorsal mesogastrium it drapes downward and this is going to form the greater omentum and the gap that is present posterior to the stomach it is now known as the superior recess of a lesser omentum and this gap of the greater omentum it is known as the inferior recess of the lesser omentum we will talk about this omental bursa later on before that let's see how the stomach the part of a the stomach they are derived from the different part of the germ layer the endoderm it forms the epithelial cell and other cells of the epithelium like the mucous neck cell parietal cell gastric cell and the chip cells and the other part of the mucosa like lamina propria muscularis mucosa sub mucosa and the muscularis section are consist of the inner oblique middle circular and the outer longitudinal layer along with the serosa they are derived from the visceral mesoderm so only the epithelial lining and this different cells they are derived from the endoderm rests of the layers below the lamina propria they are derived from the visceral mesoderm so over here this red color is the visceral mesoderm and this yellow color line structure is the endoderm now let's talk about the formation of the omental bursa this is the transverse section along the stomach which is suspended to the posterior abdominal wall with the help of a dorsal mesogastrium and anterior abdominal wall with the help of a ventral mesogastrium in the dorsal mesogastrium now this is the mesenchymal bar initially the dorsal mesogastrium it is in the form of a mesenchymal bar and there occurs the appearance of a vacuoles in the mesenchymal bar which we call it as a nemoenteric vacuoles and this nemoenteric vacuoles they fuse to form they fuse and they make the slimming of this dorsal mesenchymal bar it slims down and it also it remains in the form of a two different layer that we now call it as a dorsal mesentery and this gap formed over here it is modified with the rotation of the stomach because of that there is increase in the transverse transverse length of this omental bursa we can see the similar changes there is increase in the transverse length of this omental bursa because of the rotation of the stomach and the mesenchymal bar it is how it is formed in uh, forming the dorsal mesentery with the help of a formation of this nemoenteric vacuoles we can see this in the this uh, part in this picture we can see over here the gut tube it is being suspended with the help of a dorsal mesentery and a ventral mesentery and the clefts are being formed the when we see the transverse section we can see the similar structure that we discussed right now and as the stomach rotates the gap behind the stomach which we call it as a omental bursa or the lesser sac it increases in size and the upward recess of this sac is known as the superior recess and in the transverse section we can see 
the omental birds are being formed because of the rotation of the stomach. The size of the omental bursa is being increased and the superior part it is superiorly uh, checked by the development of a diaphragm. This superior recess of this bursa it is superiorly cut off with the diaphragm. And in this picture we can see the further advancement of a development of a stomach. There is the increase in size of the omental bursa because of the rotation of the stomach. We can see it in a transverse section and because of the rotation of the stomach this greater omentum it, as it drops downward it forms the inferior recess of this omental bursa. We can see the inferior recess being formed in this section. And as the development proceeds, we can see there is the increase in the length of this inferior recess and the omental bursa being formed behind the stomach. We can see there is also in the increase in the transverse diameter or the transverse length of this omental bursa. As it drops downward, there occurs the further changes in the greater omentum. We can see the mesentery around the anterior surface and the posterior surface of the stomach it forms it covers this two uh, anterior and posterior surface it wraps downward and again it moves upward we can see the first layer forming the fourth layer and second layer forming the third layer and they are attached to the posterior abdominal wall in along the duodenum and the pancreas and later on the second and third layer it fuse with one another and there occurs the further changes in the mesentery of the transverse colon as well. And this fusion, it causes the greater momentum to be fused with the transverse colon and the transverse major colon, it all there occurs the changes and with the help of that, we can see over here the greater momentum, it is fused with the transverse colon and this root of the transverse major colon, now it fuses with this and it is now attached on the anterior surface of the pancreas. So root of the transverse major colon it is now on the anterior surface of the pancreas and the duodenum. And the greater momentum its final attachment is on the anterior surface of the transverse colon. And this part it is now called as a gastrocolic ligament of the stomach. We can see the similar structure over here. The greater momentum it is being formed the greater momentum in the adult stage it wraps downward and covers this different intestinal viscera. We talked about the lesser sac that is lying behind the stomach and rest of the abdominal cavity that is lying anterior to the stomach and anterior to the intestine that is known as the greater sac or and this greater sac and the later, lesser sac they are in communication with one another through a foramen known as epiploid foramen. So this is the change that we saw right now. Initially, we get, there is the presence of the stomach, there is the development of a liver in the region of a septum transversum, there is a development of a spleen and pancreas in the dorsal mesogastrium. As the stomach rotates, we can see the lesser momentum being formed and this is the sorry lesser sac being formed and this region is the greater sac initially there is wide in communication but later on because of the rotation of the stomach the communication narrows and that communication we call it as a epiploic foramen or the omental foramen so part of the sac that is lying behind the stomach is known as the lesser sac or the omental bursa and the part of the abdominal cavity that is lying anterior to this abdominal viscera like the intestine and the stomach that is known as the greater sac and this greater sac and the lesser sac they are in communication with one another through this epiploic foramen. So this epiploic foramen anteriorly it is bounded with the lesser omentum. Specifically when we talk about the lesser omentum it is the hepatodudinal part of the lesser omentum that is bounding the epiploic foramen anteriorly and through this the lesser sac and the greater sac they communicate with one another as the spleen and the pancreas they develop in the dorsal mesogastrium 
because of this development of this different organs and the positional changes of this organ there occurs the changes in the dorsal mesogastrium so we can see in this picture the spleen is being developed and the pancreas is being developed in the dorsal mesentery or the dorsal mesogastrium and because of the further development what happens is that the pancreas it the mesentery fuses to the posterior abdominal wall and the pancreas become retroperitoneal and as the spleen develops now we can see the part of a dorsal mesentery it uh, they are given the different name so the part of a dorsal mesentery which is communicating the stomach and the spleen it is known as the gastrolineal ligament and similarly there is a communication between the spleen and the left kidney through the linearenal ligament so these are all the derivatives of the dorsal mesogastrium and part of the ventral mesogastrium that is communicating the stomach or that is attaching the stomach and the liver is known as the lesser omentum and the structure which is attaching this liver to the anterior abdominal wall is the falciform ligament so these are the different derivatives of the ventral mesogastrium and the dorsal mesogastrium we will talk about this derivative later on as well now let's talk about the abnormalities associated with the development of the stomach the stomach usually it is not associated with the different abnormalities but sometimes there may occur the abnormalities that in the pyloric region that is known as pyloric stenosis this pyloric stenosis occurs because of the hypertrophy of the muscularis externa specifically when we talk about the muscularis externa the circular layer is more hypertrophic and because of that there is a narrow lumen in the pyloric region so that the food cannot pass from the stomach into the duodenum and this mass it is clinically known as olive and it obstruct the passage of the food and because of that there is the projectile vomiting and it is commonly associated with the monozygotic twinnings now let's talk about the another part of a foregut derivative that is the duodenum the duodenum it has got the dual origin it arises from the part of a foregut and the part of a midgut so the foregut and the midgut part they are separated with the opening of this hepatic diverticulum into the gut tube so cranial to this opening of the hepatic diverticulum which is the future common bile duct cranial to that is the foregut distal to that is the midgut and we can see that this part of a duodenum we can see over here in this picture it is suspended to the posterior abdominal wall with the help of a mesentery and also it is attached to the anterior abdominal wall with the help of the ventral mesentery and as the stomach rotates there occurs the positional changes in this duodenum as well the duodenum which was initially a tubular structure vertical tubular structures because of the position of the positional change of the stomach it becomes c shaped in structure and there occurs the rotation of the duodenum as well and because of that the part of a common bile duct which was opening initially on the ventral side now because of it the bile duct it comes to lie and the opening also it comes to lie on the posterior side of the duodenum because of that the bile duct it comes to lie on the posterior relation of the first part of a duodenum and there also occurs the changes in the position of the ventral pancreatic bud because of that rotation the ventral pancreatic bud which is developed in the ventral pancreas now it moves towards the dorsal pancreatic bud and they fuses that's why the pancreas ultimately it is formed in the dorsal mesentery and we can see over here the part of a bile duct it is lying posterior to the first part of a duodenum and the opening of a common bile duct now it is on the posterior side of the duodenum and the part of a foregut which is part of a gut tube which is cranial to this opening of a common bile duct it is the foregut and distal to it is the midgut 
and since this duodenum it is derived from this both foregut and medgut it is supplied with both the celiac artery and the superior mesenteric artery and in this picture we can see the peritoneal relation of the stomach uh, sorry duodenum the duodenum which was initially intraperitoneal we can see the mesentery attaching this duodenum to the posterior abdominal wall and initially the duodenum it is intraperitoneal but later on because of the positional changes of this duodenum influenced by the rotation of the stomach its mesentery fuses with the dorsal abdominal wall now it becomes secondarily retroperitoneal along with the pancreas which also becomes secondary retro, secondarily retroperitoneal and the epithelium of this duodenum it undergoes rapid proliferation initially but later on it undergoes recanalization process through the cavity formation this cavity which were initially in the form of the narrow vacuoles they fuse with one another and forms a complete recanalized tube as i previously told the duodenum which is derived from the part of a foregut and the part of a midgut since the artery supply to this foregut and the midgut there it is the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery both of them are supplying the duodenum and the recanalization process which starts in the fifth and sixth week sixth week it completes in the eighth week and during the eighth week the ventral part of the duodenum which is attached to the anterior abdominal wall through the ventral mesentery and most of the part the ventral mesentery disappears except in the first part of the duodenum and talking about the uh, developmental anomalies of the duodenum two abnormalities i have displayed over here the first one is the duodenal stenosis in the duodenal stenosis there is the narrowing of the lumen of the duodenum and this is because of the partial recanalization of the duodenum because of this partial recanalization the lumen is partially open and because of that the lumen is narrowed and this duodenal stenosis it is associated with the bilious vomiting specifically when the bile duct it is opening cranial to the stenosis if there is the stenosis below that opening the bile duct can be refluxed and there occurs the bilious vomiting and it is also associated with the polyhydroaminosis as the circulation of the amniotic fluid cannot occur because of this narrowing of the lumen and there is the radiographic sign observed when we see this barrier we see this stenosis under the barrier mill that is known as double bubble sign and because of the distended stomach because of the accumulation of the gas and the distended duodenum there is the appearance of the double bubble sign in the radiograph and there is the another abnormality that is the duodenal atresia this atresia it is the complete occlusion of the lumen that is because of the failure of the recanalization the lumen is completely obstructed and it usually occurs at the junction of the hepatopancreatic ampulla so this much for now thank you very much in this lecture we talked about the development of a foregut and in the foregut we talked about the development of esophagus development of a stomach and development of a duodenum and other derivatives of this foregut they are like liver pancreas gall bladder we will be talking about that in the upcoming lecture i think this lecture was fruitful thank you very much if you have any suggestions or if you want to be in touch with me please hit a like on my facebook page www.facebook.com/janaklecture you can subscribe my youtube channel www.youtube.com/janaklecture or you can email to me at this email address anatomy.janak@gmail.com